Hi, this is Emerald and welcome to the Diamond Net. And today I'm going to be sharing with you a helpful tool that you can use for self-discovery and contemplation. Okay, so in this video, I'm going to be sharing with you a perspective that I use as a tool for self-discovery and self-exploration. And so what I want to say first is that my perspective is one that I would describe as multi-perspectival. This means that I look from the vantage point of a lot of different paradigms. And so I might have a tendency to put on the scientific lens in certain instances or put on a more spiritual lens in other instances or look through the lens of certain schools of philosophy. And so basically it's like switching lenses depending on what the situation is. And you know, oftentimes I'll get multiple lens viewpoints of looking at a particular, um, a particular phenomenon. And this tends to, in my experience, produce a lot of interesting results in terms of insights that I get, and I share many of these insights here on this channel. And one of the things that's necessary when it comes to using multiple perspectives is to be able to remain a fence sitter in terms of really not knowing anything. You know, so it's not saying this is the right perspective or that's the right perspective or this is the absolute perspective or this is the absolute perspective. It's really staying in this space of neutrality and being able to try on all these different perspectives as lenses. And the way that I do this is by reminding myself that I can't know anything beyond a shadow of a doubt just by the virtue of the limits of the human mind. So the tool or the perspective that I'm going to share with you is a particular lens that I like to look through in order to understand the world in a particular way and to understand myself as a result of what I see in the world. And there tends to be two polar perspectives here, two binary perspectives. So one of those perspectives is the default perspective, which most people tend to operate off of, which is, okay, I'm a small human being in this infinitely large and impersonal universe. And so I'm just one teeny itty bitty part of like this huge and infinite whole. And that tends to be my default perspective. It's, it's the lens that I wear the most often. However, when I'm engaging in the opposite side of the spectrum, it's a really great tool for contemplation and for understanding myself at a deeper level. So the perspective that I put on instead is a more solipsistic perspective, where instead of being just one small person in this infinitely large and impersonal universe, instead I think about myself and my consciousness as being the container for all of reality. And that all of these things in reality emanate from my consciousness or are created by my consciousness. And so instead of me being a small part in a vastly, you know, large universe that's impersonal, it's like I have my own personal universe that exists right here in my consciousness. And I am both the spectator of that universe and I'm the creator of that universe. Now, before I go any further into this, I want to give a caveat and a little bit of like a warning. So what I would say is that this practice is one that's probably best not to practice if you're a person who happens to have issues with psychosis or has some other condition that makes it difficult for you to stay grounded in the consensus perspective. So there are certain psychiatric conditions where a person can make connections between things that, that aren't actually there and that it can create paranoia or it can create harm to themselves or, you know, different things like that. And so with these types of practices, what I would recommend is that, you know, if you have a hard time staying rooted in the default consensus perspective where you understand yourself as a small person in an infinite impersonal universe, if that's a difficult thing, I don't recommend going in to this perspective. And generally speaking for anybody, what I recommend is to do what I call like rooting and branching. So you want to keep yourself rooted in the default consensus perspective, you know, to recognize that you don't know anything for sure. And so you don't know which perspective is actually true or isn't true because we can't know that beyond a shadow of a doubt just because of the limitations of our human perception. But we stay with the default perspective because that's the functional perspective. That's the one where we actually get to move about in this universe and actually make things happen. And so we want to keep our roots in the default consensus perspective. And we want to branch out and explore these other perspectives that deviate from that. And so that way we don't get ungrounded from, let's say, our role in day-to-day -day life and our experience as this person that has to go about, you know, this world and that has limitations and things like that. So 
we want to stay rooted there and branch our perspective into this other perspective. Another metaphor for this would be understanding this more solipsistic, we are the container of the universe kind of perspective is like going into a cave, but we keep like a tether tied around us, you know, that links us to the area outside of the cave so that we can find our way back to it. And like I said, if you tend to have a tether that breaks easily or a weak tether, I don't recommend going into this cave. And my channel name is actually named for these two perspectives. So there's a story called the Diamond Net of Indra. And Indra is a Hindu god, but uh, the Diamond Net of Indra was actually created by Buddhists. Um, and so basically in the story, um, the god Indra hangs this infinite diamond net up in the sky. And basically, this, this net stretches on forever and ever in every direction. And so it's an infinite net. And at each of the vortices of the net, there's a jewel. And each one of those jewels reflects all of the other jewels in the net. And so if you look into one of the jewels, you will see the reflection of infinite amounts of jewels. You know, so, and you can look from two perspectives. So you can look at yourself as one single jewel within the entirety of this infinite net, you know, so it's just one small part of this infinite net. Or you can look at the fact that within your one jewel is the reflection of all of the other jewels. And so we could say that there's only one jewel, but then there's also, you know, one jewel among many, many infinite amounts of jewels. And so to name off these perspectives in shorthand, we can call, let's say, the many jewels perspective, the consensus perspective, and the one jewel perspective as being more of like the solipsistic, um, like sort of one perspective, where we're the container of all of reality. And so from here on out, I'll just refer to it as the consensus perspective and the one jewel perspective. Now, as I'd mentioned before, in order to skillfully flip between these two perspectives of the many jewels versus the one jewel, um, what we have to do is we have to understand that we can't know anything beyond a shadow of a doubt. And this not knowing that we have is far more profound than people often realize because it's very, very little that we can know. There's actually a great book if you want to check it out. It's called The Book of Not Knowing and it's by Peter Ralston. And he basically goes into lots of different like inquiries and questions that you can ask yourself about, you know, it's about getting you to understand what is it that you assume to be true? What is it that you believe to be true versus what is it that you know to be true? And really nothing is in that bucket of I know this to be true. No matter how empirical your observations are, it's one of those things where you have the limits of your own subjective experience. Everything that you've ever experienced comes through the bubble of your subjective experience. So for example, if I point to my shirt here and I say this is gray and you agree that it's gray, we can't even guarantee that there's anything actually beyond our own subjective experiences. That like Maybe this could be a totally different color or maybe from your perspective, I'm not even here and it's just, you know, it's one big solipsistic thing and there's nothing outside of of your perspective, you know, there's so much that we cannot know. And there's a phrase that refers to the way that an animal experiences their subjective experience, and it's called an umwelt. And so this means that, let's say, we might look at a situation and we see like a certain range of colors and we, we see it a particular way, but if we had the umwelt of a fly, reality would look totally different. And it's not as to say that our interpretation of reality or our lens is like accurate. You know, we couldn't even necessarily say that our lens is more accurate than the fly's lens is because we cannot know that. So our umwelt, you know, is our only anchor point that we have to experience things and it's limited, you know, so given that we have these limited faculties, we cannot know really anything about the way that reality functions beyond a shadow of a doubt. And oftentimes philosophers would come to a variety of different conclusions about if there's a thing in itself or if we can experience the thing in itself and if so, how we can experience the thing in itself. But ultimately, the reality is, and you can notice this directly, is that you can never know the thing in itself because you're only ever perceiving through, you know, through the lens of your five senses and whatever sense that your thoughts can make from what's taken in by your five senses. And anything that's happened in the past doesn't exist anymore. And anything that happens in the future, that doesn't exist yet. We only have just this one single hair of a moment. And because of this fundamental limitation, 
it's important to consider that every single assumption that you have about reality might be false and very likely is false. And this leaves the door to be open to either one of these perspectives on the diamond net to be true. You know, so it could be that the consensus perspective is true where there's many jewels or that the one jewel perspective is true and that you're the container for all other jewels in the net. And you can try to figure this out and you can try to deduce, you know, which one's the right perspective, but that's really not the point because, you know, fundamentally the, the experience of being a human being is to be dancing with the mystery all the time. Who knows, perhaps the universe began two seconds ago and all of your, re or all of your memories are just an illusion to create a sense of continuity. For all you know about the way that things work, that could be true. But don't believe that to be true because then that's falling over on the other side of the horse because we can't know that to be true either. So when it comes to the idea of knowing something, we want to always remain a fence sitter and we don't want to fall over on the other side, you know, either side of that fence. We want to maintain this sense of curiosity and openness. It's the idea of keeping our cup open so that we can receive new insights. And so whenever we can keep our cup empty, we can start to look from these different perspectives and switch between them with ease. Now to get into the nuts and bolts of how to use the one jewel perspective for your own contemplation and self-discovery purposes. So as a reminder, the one jewel perspective is where your consciousness is the container for everything in existence. And everything in existence is an emanation of yourself, is a creation of yourself and that you're the container and creator for all things within the scope of your awareness. Now, one of the things that you want to become conscious of with this is that you possess a fundamental self-interest. And from the consensus perspective, that self-interest can feel very selfish because it's like, oh no, I want good things to happen to myself. Why do I want good things to happen to myself? And so oftentimes we can resist this self-interest that we have or try to rid ourselves of self-interest in order to be more selfless. But from the one jewel perspective, actually self-interest is one of the most loving and, and best things that we can have because once we realize that everything is an emanation of our self and everything that's going on in our reality is self, we can start to have this sense of unconditional love toward all things in reality. And in the same way that if we feel at one within our self, the small self, we aren't going to want to cause harm to ourselves, and we aren't going to want to experience negative things. In that same way, when we look out at reality, we aren't going to want to cause problems for another person because we recognize it as, you know, cutting off the no nose despite the face. You know, so if we see somebody else in the scope of our awareness that, you know, we don't like, or let's say if we wish ill on that person, well, ultimately, if we recognize that that person is an emanation of ourself, then we're wishing ill on a part of ourself. So if in the one jewel perspective, you recognize that everything in reality is a part of you, and then you have this fundamental like self-interest that comes from a sense of self-love, it's really a very loving perspective to have because everything gets enveloped in that love. You know, it's like you get to kind of almost cradle everything in your own perspective. And you can look to people and places and things and events that are happening in your individual life or on the geopolitical stage, and you can recognize them as an expression of yourself. You know, so if you have certain elements of yourself in the shadow and that's part of this whole umwelt, then it's like they might show up in the externals. And so we can actually look to external events happening in our day-to-day -day life or on the, the global stage. And we can say, okay, if I am the container for all things that happen and this is happening, this must be a part of me. And so we can use that as a mirror reflection to start exploring ourselves more deeply. And this can be something that's very difficult to stomach, you know, especially if there are things that are going on out there in the world that we really, really dislike. Like if there's a person who's causing all sorts of problems for us, or let's say there's a certain, you know, political thing happening or a war or something happening, it can be kind of difficult to stomach the idea that they would come as an emanation of ourself. Now, a caveat that I would give here and a little bit of a warning, especially for people who have a tendency to take a lot of responsibility for things going on anyway, you know, is to insulate yourself from the idea that you're responsible for any of the things going on externally or that you're to blame for any of the things going on externally. So 
leave those sense of that sense of responsibility or, you know, blame only for the consensus perspective, you know, when it comes to taking control over what you actually as a small self have control over, you know, so do things in your power to help, but don't feel like you have to save the world. And so in the same way here, let's say if we shift over to the one jewel perspective, and we're trying to take responsibility for everything that's going on there, well, that's going to be really overwhelming. We're going to be like one tablespoon of butter trying to spread ourselves over every piece of bread in the universe. And so you don't want to put yourself through that. So even though we're, we're doing this practice where we're recognizing everything is an emanation of the self, that doesn't mean you're responsible and it doesn't mean that you're to blame and that it would be quite crazy making to take that perspective if you did try to take responsibility for it all. So from this one dual perspective, you only want to look at the external situation as a mirror and as purely informational about what might be going on inside of yourself. As it tends to be that our behaviors tend to impact the external world, but the external world also impacts our behaviors. And so basically we have kind of this back and forth going on. And so if you notice that there's some kind of negative situation out here, it's like there's probably some kind of equivalent negative situation internally that you can look to, or at least some lower analog of the external situation going on. So these two perspectives, the consensus perspective and the one jewel perspective, tend to be um, active whenever it's the case that we're looking at dreams. So when we're in the dream, we're in the illusion of the consensus perspective. So we experience ourselves as a dream character kind of moving through the dream and we're interacting with different people that we assume are separate people from us and we're interacting with different places and we have this kind of assumption usually as we're going through the dream. But then we wake up and we realize, oh wow, all this dream was happening inside of my own mind. You know, it wasn't like I was this separate dream character. In fact, me as the dream character was just part of the whole dream too. And then all all the other people that showed up in all the places were just an emanation of my unconscious mind. And so when we're doing dream work, we want to look at the dream and we want to look at all the things that happened in the dream, the different characters that showed up, the settings that came up, the events that happened, the objects that showed up, all of these different things we want to take as a symbolic information about ourselves and about what's going on in the unconscious. And so the one jewel perspective is to look at reality as though it's your own personal dream. And so if you have characters that show up or settings that show up or something happens on the geopolitical stage, it's part of your dream symbols that you can look into. And you can start to think, oh, interesting, this person showed up and they said that thing. What might that reflect about me? Or, oh, interesting, this thing happened. You know, there was some scandal with some politicians. Okay, what does that say about me? Oh, there was a cat walked around over there on the road. Oh, what does that say about me? And so it's sort of like looking into reality and trying to read it symbolically. And on one level, even if the one jewel perspective is not true, we can always read into reality for the things that we project upon it. And so it's a valuable exercise, even if let's say the one jewel perspective is totally false. But this is something that helps us kind of get more in touch with mythos and more in touch with our intuition because we start to look at reality in this very interconnected way where we don't feel so separate from everything happening and, and nothing feels so impersonal. And so everything's very personal to us when we look from this perspective. And one of the most valuable things you can do is to look at the parts of reality that you can accept the very least. You know, so whether it's maybe particular political stances being widespread or it's, let's say, you know, wars and genocides or, you know, a variety of different things that are unpleasant, like the, the existence of serial killers or maybe there is a particularly tyrannical person in your life or, you know, like a lot of unfairness going on. So if you see that manifesting in your reality outside of yourself, you want to look and, and you want to pay attention to that because it's an indicator of how you can grow internally. You know, so the more that you can start to recognize your shadow, you know, in the external situation, the more that you can come to know those parts of yourself. And if this one dual perspective happens to be true, the more you integrate those things on the inside, the less they start to manifest in the external. 
All right, so that's all I have for you for this video. If you want to learn more about shadow work and consciousness work in general, I highly recommend checking out my shadow work playlist. It's got about 25, 26 videos on there um, where you can like get a really in-depth kind of um, multi-perspectival look at, at the topic of shadow work. And so go ahead and click this link here. Um, you can also check out my shadow work masterclass. Um, so basically that's at shadowintegration.org slash masterclass and it's free to register. And anyway, that's all I have for you for now. And until next time, keep becoming more you.